and it's batch for the conditori. Mm-hmm. Batch for it is. It is the Duca de uh, Duca de Asta class, which well, they're named after one of my favorite generals of all time, and they're named after a general who is one of the best self puppetists of all time, and I swear could have given MacArthur lessons. You can figure out from what I say during them which I think is which. It's going to be fun. It's Italian. They're good ships, but they're named by a fascisty dictatorship. So, let's look at the base outline of this design. Hmm. You will notice the AA and secondary... Pardon me. The AA and secondary armament is concentrated aft, but forward of the main battery guns, which are aft as well. So, it's sort of... Gives you an idea of where they think they're going to be getting attacked from the air from, uh, but also does present a little bit of a weakness, I would say. Uh, it would seem to me that, again, this is one of those things and decisions made due to making these ships as light as they could be. And I think it's a weakness. I do think it's a weakness. I think they, they're an interesting vessel. They also have a single catapult, but they could take up to three aircraft. That would require two, one stowed either side of the catapult, sort of in a semi sort of packed up position, and one stowed on the catapult itself. Possible in the Mediterranean, not something you'd really advise for ship operating in the Atlantic and not even really in the Pacific. But still, nice lines. They're good ships. So their stats. 8,450 tons in standard. 10,539 tons fully loaded. Length 186.9 meters. Beam 17 and a half meters. Draft 6.1 meters. Six Yero boilers supplying two shafts via Beluzo Parsons geared turbines with 110,000 shaft horsepower, I'm fairly certain, for a top speed of 36.5 knots or a range of 3,900 nautical miles at 14 knots. Okay. Eight 152 millimeter guns. Otto model 1929. Uh, six 100mm guns. Those are those um, heavy AA wood guns, which I was pointing out. That's basically four inch ones, and they're Otto model 1928. 837mm uh, Breda model 1932 AA cannons in four twin mounts, and 12 13.2mm Breda model 1931 machine guns in six twin mounts. And six 21 inch, that's 533 millimeter torpedo tubes in two triples. They had 35 millimeters of deck armor, 70 millimeter main belt, the turrets had 90 millimeters, and the conning tower had 100 millimeters of armor. So, long range engagements only, preferably with nothing with a gun larger than, I don't know, let's see. Well, honestly, 90 millimeters of armor, medium range, a 4.7 or 4.5 inch is probably going to get through that. Even a five, uh, even a, fi a five inch certainly has a chance. Armor piercing, of course, armor piercing. Let's be nice. So the Emmanuel Filiberto Dosta. This is a good ship. It has an interesting career. It starts off as part of the 2nd Cruiser Squadron, participating in the Battle of Punta Stilo. And she takes part in several North African convoys and took part in the fleet store as he against uh, British cruisers and bombarded Confu in December 1940. In 1941, she was mostly part of 8th Cruiser Division. 
taking part in laying minefields, which is always quite a dangerous role, but they do it and do it well. And does John Boy duties, and one of which leads to her participating in the first Battle of Surt. Now, 1942, she takes part in operations against Allied convoys as well as doing, of course, Italian convoys. The Mediterranean is a convoy war. Often the battles are convoys, different convoys coming in to, in, to engage with each other rather than each side sending forces against those convoys. Usually, unless you're hearing the battle fleets turning up from the Italians or Force K from the British, those convoys are convoys engaging convoys. If you think convoy escort in the North Atlantic is interesting, wait until you look at the Mediterranean convoy escort and the reality of what you need when you're against an actual physically here active full spectrum threat. Submarines, aircraft, and large surface combatants. There is a reason the forces deployed for Harpoon, Vigorous, and those other convoys are quite so comprehensive and include the presence of 16-inch battleships whenever they're available. The British have two of them. Both of them go on one convoy. That's a lot of firepower to be sending as a convoy escort. A lot of firepower. And you don't send that on that kind of uh, that kind of duty unless you're really worried about the firepower they might run into. Now, she survived torpedo attacks, and she had an interesting war. I'll talk more about her torpedo attacks in a bit, but for now, I want to talk about this gentleman, Prince Emmanuel Philiberto, uh, Duke of the Osta. So. He is considered the undefeated duke. Now, I always consider that, even when people tell me that as a good thing, and say, he was the undefeated duke. I look and go, hmm. You see, in military history terms, there's another gentleman called an Iron Duke, and the reason he's called the Iron Duke is because there are various reasonings behind him, including, jokingly, that he had iron shutters fitted to his house to deal with ri the effect of any rioters who might lob things through there when he was Prime Minister. Various other reasons put, put forward, but Steely Reserve and the fact that he held the line, he would always hold the line, and he would stand there with his troops was one of the reasons why Wellesley was called the Iron Duke. Of course, the Duke of Wellington. Now, basically, the Third Army gets a reputation for being the ones who successfully managed to withdraw in the face of utter and total annihilation of other forces, usually. Usually, other forces get annihilated and the Third Army manages to pull back while they're dying. So they are undefeated. Now, this is not to critique the men and women of the Third Army. And there were women supporting them in the various nursing camps, etc. So, you know, they, they are, frankly, what they see in those camps deserves them a, 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 a factor of mention. And anyone who disagrees with that, look up some of the pictures of some of the field hospitals in World War One. But don't do it after you've had lunch. Do it before you eat. You probably won't feel like eating afterwards. If you do it afterwards, you might not retain the lunch inside you. But the trouble is for the Italian Third Army, is whilst its units fight very well when they're allowed to fight, they do have a habit of managing to be withdrawn before they can get Mucked up. Now this means they still get a, a reputation being undefeated, but it doesn't exactly give them the laurels that you think it should. But it also shows the uh, reputations of the other armies, the fact that during the Cold War, the Italians actually, when they're dealing with potential problems from Yugoslavia, which of course isn't a Warsaw Pact member, so an a aggression by Yugoslavia against Italy might not have led to NATO getting involved because would NATO want to get involved in a war against Yugoslavia, which was kind of a useful thing to to wind up 
Um, the Warsaw Pact with, ooh, ooh, who knows? So the Italians came up with the Third Army again. Now, the Asta actually was a very successful ship. She was a lucky ship. She was never damaged in any naval actions in which she took participate, nor was she ever damaged by air attack or submarine attack. So she did really, really well. Um, not so well when she was transferred over to the Soviet Union in after World War II to serve as the Kerch, but you know, she did as well as she could do. And she actually served alongside the Allies as part of the South Atlantic um, shipping blockade duties and based in Freetown after Italy changed sides. But during the war, HMS Unison here, this lovely U-class vessel, yes, Unison, um, actually fired several torpedoes at her. And the remainder of Monte Carli. And they missed. Which is unusual, because Unison has quite a good track record. Unison is one of those submarines you really, really do not want to take on. Um, in fact, as submarines go, this is a vessel which has a habit of normally hitting its targets. Um, she sank the merchant vessels Enrieta, Marco Foscani, and Terni, uh, sailing vessels Luigi Verni, Carlo P, and Angela, the German coaster Jadiker, and the Italian Tangazella. She also damaged the Posacera and, well, Damaged, but didn't torpedo, didn't sink uh, a few other ships as well. However, the 13th of June 1942 is a day she'll always probably remember because she had two, two Italian cruisers in sight and she doesn't manage to hit either of them. However, she shares something with the vessel she was attacking that day. She's also transferred to the Soviet Navy, but her the transfer takes place on 26th June 1944. She's renamed V3 and spends five years in Soviet service before being returned in 1949 and scrapped in Stockholm. Stockholm. Sorry. Hmm. Eugenio de Savia. Now, this is a ship really worthy of attention. Mainly because it's named after someone who's really quite cool. But also someone who, well, let's be honest, we'll talk about him in a bit. Now, her career highlights include taking on and probably being responsible for doing most of the damage to HMS Bedouin, which leads her to be going so slowly that she actually managed to get finished off by a torpedo bomber. There are very few destroyers which get taken out by torpedo bombers in World War II. Or Bedouin, a tribal class destroyer, is one of them, thanks to this vessel's gunfire. And I do realize that tribals like to sink condutory class regular cruisers, so I do understand that if you see one coming, you fire first and ask questions later, but still. Getting a torpedo bomber to finish it off, that's just being insulting. Anyway. She spent a large chunk of World War II with the 7th Cruiser Division. Uh, she'd taken part in the various patrols for the, during the Spanish Civil War. And part of her patrols had included bombarding Barcelona, causing 18 deaths. She took part in a second navigation of the world with her sister in 1938-39, the Osta and returned to La Spazia in March 1939. She fought as part of the Battle of Potosilo, Operation Harpoon, of course where Bedouin happens, and Operation Pedestal. However, in December 1942, she's hit by bombs from a Liberator, 
bomber, which was striking Napoli. So, yeah, she's then used a training ship in Suez, and after the war, she's transferred to the Greeks, where she's called the Eli as part of their service. And part of reparation as well. She's, of course, named for Prince Eugene Francis of Savoy, Caragion, who is a very capable general for his era. However, he's born of Italian parentage, broadly speaking, Italian parentage, in France, where he grows up and hopes to serve in the French army, but when the king says he doesn't think he's tall enough or well enough, he takes it personally and goes off and joins the Austro-Hungarians instead. And, um, yeah, the rest is history. He spends most of his time trying to beat up Louis XIV and doing a fairly decent job of it. These are his own words. Some future historians, good or bad, will perhaps take the trouble to enter into the details of my youth, of which I scarcely recollect anything. They will certainly speak of my mother, somewhat too intriguing, driven from the court, exiled from Paris and suspected, I believe, of sorcery, by people who were not themselves very great wizards. They will tell how I was born in France, then left it, my heart swelling with enmity against Louis XIV, who refused me a cavalry company, because, said he, I was of too delicate a constitution. Then he refused me an abbey, because, based on I don't know what uh, ill talks about me, or what invented anecdotes from the Gallery of Versailles, that I was far more shaped for pleasure than for piety. There is not a Huguenot expelled from the revocation, uh, expelled by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, who hated Louis XIV more than I did. Therefore, when Louis Vu uh, heard of my departure, saying, so much the better, he will never return into this country again, I swore never to enter it but with arms in my hand. I have kept my word. He was a simple soldier. A contemporary of Marlborough, a friend of Marlborough. Whereas Marlborough built a great house, a great family, built a dynasty which gave us the Churchills and many others. He didn't. He never married. Although he seems to have very much enjoyed visiting brothels and had a lovely time, and certainly had a significant paramour in his later life. He collected a great deal of art, usually by purchasing it, but sometimes acquiring it on the battlefield. Sometimes. Um, he was paid well for his services. He brought victories, many of them. And he lived a good many years. But, and I say this with the nicest possible feelings in my heart for Italy. Considering the classifications used for Condottori were Italian generals who had fought for Italy, I'm not quite sure the guy who spends most of his time fighting in Northern Europe for one power who occupies a significant part of Italy at some point, especially at that point, against a power who doesn't really qualifies as a condottori. I think it's a stretch. And this, of course, was poor Bedouin. Look what that torpedo bomber did to her. It's just not right. If you're going to hit and cause this much, her to be damaged enough, she's slow enough to be killed by a torpedo bomber with your six inch guns, then the decent thing is to close and finish her off with your six inch guns, not leave her for a torpedo bomber. It's just rude. Anyway. Are they a good class? Well, I like them.
okay, they don't have enough armor to escort anything. So you can't use them really for convoy work, but they do. They're not, they're fast, but they're not a deal of maxman fast, so you haven't sacrificed everything for speed, which is strange if that's your actual emphasis. They have a nice layout of guns, and they have a capability in terms of crew and quality of personnel. But honestly, they needed to be roughly a thousand to two thousand tons heavier. Probably drop three or four knots maximum. And because if you could drop it down to thirty three and a half knots, you could say uh, the, increase the ton of displacement, probably leaves all the engines, etc., the same. But you could have so much more protection on that ship that can make it so much more viable and it'll be a really really good ship saying that both members of the class survived the war which isn't a bad thing and does speak to the fact that the designers were not completely off their trolleys when producing these ships by this point there are some of the early ones i have bigger reservations about but this they do have armor um, although why they're wasting so much on um, on, on the conning tower, I do not understand at all. I just don't. I don't. Right. So. I was asked during brew ships what's coming up next. And of course, next week, the cruiser is the Shapiev class. Project uh, 68 of the Soviet Navy. Bonus? Well, I thought we would talk about Eugene de Savoy's other ships named after him. There is, of course, Prince Eugene of the Austro-Hungarian Ironclad, suitable as he was one of their generals, and Prince Eugen of the Austro-Hungarian battleship fame. There is the Prince Eugene, uh, Eugene of the Lord Clive class monitor of the Royal Navy fame. There is, of course, the Eugene de Savoy of the, the Italian light cruiser. And there's the Prince Eugen, launch for Germany. Yeah, the thing that's backing up Bismarck at the Battle of Denmark Straits. But that does also tell you something about the luster of this officer. There is the fact that at various points, uh, nationalist movements in Germany try and adopt him as a gothic you know patron a revival of the gothic arts and all these things it's it's rare you have such a contested figure between two fascisty powers over they both trying to claim him historically when he does have quite so much ambiguity around him although myself considering his own words on the topic and the fact that he could afford especially when writing those ones to be um mercurial he did rather bluntly say not me sir and not in a protesting too much way and in answer to the questions from brew ships patron 62 daniel freeman what if the french navy had left france and carried on the fight of, in 1940 and then 29 september patron 63 in car escort carries the idea designs film as notable operations thank you very much for watching i hope you enjoyed i'm going to try and keep this under 24 minutes mark so thank you